to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus, our King. And Lord, we're very grateful that we get to come into the house of God tonight. Thank you for a house of God that's open and proclaiming your word so that we can come in freely and hear and understand and be built and encouraged in the ways of God. Tonight, Lord, I pray that as we open up your word that you would open it up to us. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear. Give us hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown that produces something in each and every one of our lives. God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves, but also we would ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. God, there are brothers and sisters. We love them and don't think of ourselves as any better than them, but see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in your field, building your kingdom. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody, shout it in agreement. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Grab your Bibles and go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to start out in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we'll launch out from there. And I've entitled the message tonight, The Dwelling Place. Now, when I say the dwelling place, what I mean is a place where something lives, where something resides, where something stays. We know that we are, as Christians, a dwelling place. When we were born again, when we got saved, we received the Spirit of God, The one who Jesus said was the promise of the Father. He said, I I, I give you the Spirit of God now to live on the inside of you, and you are now the temple of God. We're going to see this in a moment. We are a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. God lives now on the inside of us. God had promised. He said, I will make my tabernacle, my dwelling with men. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I had you turn there. We're going to take a look at verse number 16. And in verse 1 Corinthians 3, 3.16, it says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So these are some things that we ought to know. We ought to know that we are the temple of God. We ought to know that God lives on the inside of each and every one of us. We ought to know that in our hearts now lives the Holy Spirit. And where we once had just fears and frustrations, worries, anxieties, built up knowledge and and different things that that were there. Now the Holy Spirit lives on the inside, but those other things often go either unattended or they're allowed to stay. It's very important what we allow to live on the inside of us, what we allow to dwell on the inside of us. Because after we receive the Spirit, we're also supposed to continually set our hearts and set our minds, the Bible says, on things above. See, this is not something that automatically happens. I wish when I got saved, I just had the dial just turn to heaven and then it never went off. But how many of you can can relate to this? After you got saved, you had maybe this great experience, your heart was on fire, the birds were chirping, the air was sparkling clean, you felt like you were floating or walking on the clouds, and then after a little while, life happened. Maybe there was a problem that came up. Maybe there was some frustration. Maybe there were some fears. Maybe you encountered some old friends or or family members, got into an argument. Husband or wife came at you with something. Financial pressures and, and stresses and strains came on you. Things happened on the job. You see, in all those things, take that dial that was set to heaven before. We had the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, but all of a sudden, all these other things start to come in and start to distract and start to deter us from the things that we should be dwelling on. As Christians, we ought to be able to say, I'm going to set my heart and my mind on some things. I'm going to choose today where my mind goes, where my attention goes, what I set my interest on, how much I put in, and what I get out of it. You see, if we're going to live this life as a Christian, we're, we're going to live it in Him. Otherwise, we're not going to live it at all. Because life outside of Christ is not life at all. Jesus is the life. And so tonight, I want to talk about what we dwell on as Christians. These can work in the positive, but also they can work in the negative sense, and we'll discuss some of that tonight as we go. But what we dwell on does a couple of things in our lives. As we, as we go through the night, we're going to complete this statement, what we dwell on. And, and I believe that as we take a look at areas in our lives and find out what it is that God would have us to dwell on, that as you go out of this place and go into your life, your 
community, your family, your job, your school, whatever it is that you're going to out of this place tonight, that you're going to see what you dwell on. You're going to see the effects of it, and it's going to produce some good things in your life. Are you ready tonight? Yeah. All right. I'm glad that three of you are. <laughs> tonight, what we dwell on, a couple of things we're going to take a look at. Number one, what we dwell on dwells on us. Let me say that again. I know it sounds simple, but it's actually very profound. What we dwell on dwells on us. Whatever we dwell on will dwell on us. If I dwell on problems, problems are going to dwell on me. If I dwell on climbing the ladder of success, that ladder of success is going to dwell on me. If I dwell on my family, my family's going to dwell on me. See, some of these things can work in the positive as well as the negative. How about this one? If I dwell on God, God dwells on me. You see, whatever we dwell on will dwell on us. The more you dwell on money, the more money's going to dwell on you. The more you, you dwell on anger, the more anger's going to dwell on you. The, the more you dwell on God, the more God dwells on you. That's why the Bible says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's why Jesus said in John 15, 4, the first part, abide in me and I in you. See, we can choose what we dwell on. We can choose where our attention and our interest and our involvement goes. I applaud you guys for being here tonight on a Sunday night. You see, many churches are shutting their doors on Sunday nights because attendance is waning. Because people are setting their minds on, oh, I got to get ready for work, and I got to get ready, got to get the kids ready for school, and I got I, I to gotta get, get, get all this other stuff, and it's too late, and why go to church more than one time a week, and I can do so much more. I could listen to Christian music or radio or TV and get the same thing, and yet we don't understand that what you dwell on will dwell on you. This morning, Pastor Jim made a, a, a profound statement that just caught my attention. He said, when I got off myself, and got on God, I found out that God got on me. And the principle is true. When you get out of yourself and you get on God, all of a sudden, God gets all over you. The more interest, the more attention, the, the, the more respect you give to God, the, the more time that you give to God, the more involvement you give to God, the more God gives you interest and attention and respect and involvement in your life. Sometimes we're crying out, God, where are you? And God says, where are you? And even though God knows the answer to that question, he's asking it for our benefit. He's wanting us to get our alignment, get our eyes on him, get our focus, get our attention, get our dwelling in him. You're there in 1 Corinthians. Turn back to the Gospel of Matthew, first book in the New Testament, Matthew. We're going to take a look at Matthew chapter number 6. Talking about what we dwell on dwells on us. Matthew chapter 6, two little verses that have a big impact in our lives. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 22 and 23. Jesus is speaking and he says these words in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 22. He says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Now stop right there for a moment. I want you to picture your body, okay? Picture the outline, maybe, you know, the, the bathroom door sign. Okay, there you are. Okay, now inside of you is your heart. The lamp of the body is the eye. See, we don't see with our natural eyes. We see with our hearts, okay? So whatever is dwelling on the inside of you is going to illuminate your life, okay? The lamp of the body is the eye. If, therefore, your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. It's almost like this. You, you picture that same person standing there, and you, and you see that, that eye, that lamp on the inside of you, and it's almost like somebody just took the chain and flipped it on. If it's good, it lights up the whole body. Take a look at verse 23, though. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If, therefore, the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? What is he saying? He's saying if you pull that chain and the bulb does not come on. It's not a good bulb. If your eye is bad, then it's going to be darkness. See, there's nothing going on. Whatever you dwell on, whatever you give interest and attention to will dwell on you. So if you're giving the things of God attention, if you're giving the Word attention, if you're giving prayer attention, 
if you're giving good works attention, giving, giving, doing what God has called you to do, obedience, and walking in line with what God would have you to do. The lamp of the body is the eye, therefore your eye is good. What is good? Well, good is what God says. And if the lamp of your body is good, your whole body will be full of light. That's why Jesus says you are the light of the world. No one hides their light under a bushel. No one puts it underneath the bed. Why? They pull it out in plain view for everyone to see. See, so as we dwell on the things of God, as we give our interest and our attention to God and dwell on Him, then on the inside of us, whenever that comes time to take a look around and see what's going on on the inside, what's dwelling on the inside of us, you pull that chain or you flip that switch and the light comes on. But in the negative sense as well, if you've been dwelling on the world, you've been dwelling on problems, You've been dwelling on pressures, been dwelling on the dirt. Maybe you've been dwelling on what's on television or on the internet. Maybe you've been dwelling on gossip or something that, that the opinions and ideas of other people. Then when it comes time to find out what's on the inside of you, you're going to flip that switch and, and the filament of that lamp inside of your body is going to fizzle out. And it's just going to be dark. See, without God, our lives are dark. There's no vision. There's no direction. There, there's no way through, but when we dwell on the things of God, all of a sudden we can see. All of a sudden we can go where we need to go. Why? Because we can see the path. We can do what we need to do because we can have a good understanding. Why? Because it is now in the light. Number one, what we dwell on dwells on us. Second thing tonight is what we dwell on delivers fruit. What we dwell on delivers fruit. Fruit. I could have said produces, but I decided that each one of our, our, our numbered things that we're going to take a look at tonight will start with the letter D, because dwell starts with D. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. Did to me too. What we dwell on delivers fruit. Listen, what we dwell on doesn't just stay on the inside of us. Just like the, that light, that light is going to pour forth from you. Okay? It, it, it will shine to other people. What we dwell on is going to produce something Outside of us, there will be expressions of what we dwell on in our lives. If you've got a person that dwells on golf, start talking to them about their life. What do you like to do? Well, I like to golf, right? It'll just naturally pour out of them. People that, you know, are, are crazy about, uh, you know, going and, and watching basketball. You know, you start talking to them and it will pour out of their life. They might even buy a jersey. Uh, this morning, I believe I saw some people in, in, in football jerseys coming to church why? Because that's some of the things that they've been dwelling on, and now it has produced something. It's delivered something to their lives. It, it, it showed up. It appeared. And just like a fruit tree, there is something that's going to come out of that tree naturally by what it dwells in. As it pulls nutrients and, and water from the soil, the expression of that tree is going to be the fruit that it produces. In the same way you and I, you can tell where people are at by what is produced in their lives. Is that not true? Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. Right? What happened to the disciples? Here they are. They're preaching the gospel. They're standing up boldly. And all the people know these men were with Jesus. Right? They lived with Jesus. They stayed with Jesus. They dwelt with Jesus. And now it's expressing itself in their lives. When Peter got up and he preached his great sermon... And all the, the men and women of God were out there prophesying and speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost. The people think they're drunk. They think they're crazy. And what does Peter do? He says, he says, hey, everybody, this is what was prophesied, that the Spirit of God would be poured out on all flesh. What was he saying? He's saying, now the Spirit of God dwells in and upon us, and you're seeing the expression, the fruit. It's been delivered to you today. In the same way you and I, whatever we dwell on, Whatever's going on on the inside of us is going to be produced in our lives. Listen, you're going to have opportunities. Tomorrow morning when you go to church and your coworker sits down next to you and says, hey, what did you do this weekend? What you've dwelled on most this weekend is going to come right out of you. Some of you will say church. Some of you will say I caught the game. Some of you will say I hung out with my family. Whatever it is that you dwelt on the most is going to come out of you. Just like a tube of toothpaste. If you squeeze that tube, what comes out? Toothpaste, hopefully. <laughs> but if we squeeze a Christian, oh. 
Jesus should come out, right? Amen. Amen. Eventually, it's going to express itself in some form or another in your life. You're there in, in Matthew 6. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. We, we looked at this last week in regards to our words and in regards to gossip, but I want to take a look at it in a new light. Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 33, we'll read through the verse number 35. Matthew 12, 33, Jesus is speaking again. Take a look at what he says. Matthew 12, 33 through 35, Jesus says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. All throughout the Bible, you'll find that men and women are likened unto trees. You and I are likened unto trees. National Israel was either a fig tree or an olive tree, right? And we were grafted into that tree. See, we are trees. And Jesus is saying something here. He says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. Why? For a tree is known by its fruit. You're going to be known as a Christian, or you're going to be known as a hypocrite by what comes out of your life. Let me say that again. You're going to be known either as a Christian or as a hypocrite by what comes out of your life. Why? Because either make the tree good and it's fruit good or else make the tree bad. Don't call it something that it's not. If it's producing apples, don't call it an orange tree. Either make the tree good and it's fruit good. Either be a Christian, stand up, do what it is you've called to do, and dwell on Jesus Christ, on his word. Think about these things, man. Live, stay, and dwell in the spirit of God and allow that to be produced in your life or else make the tree bad. Quit playing. That's really what he's talking about here. Verse number 34, Jesus gets expressive, to say the least. He says, brood of vipers. Can you imagine People listening to Jesus. Here's this guy who's calling himself the son of God. And now all of a sudden he's calling them a brood of vipers. My goodness. Jesus was in their face. Brood of vipers. How can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever you got going on the, on, on the inside of you is what's going to come out of you. When you squeeze a Christian, whatever they've been putting in is going to come out. Look at verse number 35. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. I heard a minister one time talking about how he was in Hawaii on a vacation. And uh, he, he had taken some time off and was just up early because, you know, the time difference. And so here he was walking on the beach and he encountered a man and the man struck up conversation with him and they were talking. And here they were talking and, and the man would, just throughout their conversation was using filthy language and this and that. And so this minister was looking for a way to, you know, share Jesus with this guy. And as they're talking and, 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 and he's, he starts to, you know, be looking for a, a way in. And so he decides, well, I'm going to ask this guy, you know, what are you doing here in, in, in Hawaii? You know, are you on vacation? And that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, I'm here with my family and this and that. And okay. And he says, and, and what do you do? And so he found out he's a businessman and, and he's got some different things going on. And so, you know, they're just taking a break and they're there. And he says, what do you do? And he says, well, I'm a minister. And all of a sudden, oh, praise the Lord. God bless you, my brother. But see, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. See, as Christians, the more we fill ourselves up with God, the more God is going to come out of us. The more we fill ourselves up with the goodness of God and the ways of God and the Word of God, that's what's going to come out of us. Uh, I was talking to a brother today in the foyer, and he was going to go share Christ with somebody who's been given a diagnosis of just two months to live. And, and he said, I'm worried because I, I, I don't know where he's at with God, and I, I want to make sure he doesn't go to hell. And, and, and I'm afraid he, he couldn't come to church today because he felt so weak. And I said, man, then you need to go share Jesus with him. He says, I don't know that I can. I said, well, listen, you've been filled up with the things of God, and it's amazing. When you get to him, if you're filled with the Spirit and you've got the Word of God on the inside of you, you won't even know what you're saying. It will just start to pour forth from you. It'll start to come out of you, and you're going to have just the right thing to say. See, church, oftentimes we worry too much about what we're going to say, what we're going to do. Listen, just keep filling up on Jesus, and he's going to come out of you. Yeah. Colossians chapter 3, you're there in Matthew. Turn back to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, great verse. Verse 
Right after the book of Philippians, you'll find Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16. Colossians 3, 16, it says this. It says, let. Everybody say let. let. That means it's a choice. That means that you have the opportunity to do this or to deny this. You can let it happen or you cannot let it happen. It's your call. It's your choice. Let. Let what? Let the word of Christ do what? Dwell. Live. Come on the inside of you. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. See, that doesn't mean just get a little bit, a little dabble, do you? Once a week, man, maybe if I've got time, oh, I'll show up Christmas and Easter. No, that's not what this is about. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What does that mean? That means that you're pouring it in. You're getting as much of it as you can. Man, you wake up in the morning, you're getting a verse. You, you, throughout the afternoon, you're reminding yourself of these things. You're talking to people about it. You're getting filled up with it. You're listening to the Christian music. You're listening to Christian radio. People say, well, I don't like the Christian music. It's not as good as the worldly music. Give me a break. Oh, I just listened to the beats, Pastor. Yeah, it, you're going to get beat by it. Because what you dwell on will dwell on you. Sorry. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. There's the fruit. Teaching, there's the fruit. And admonishing one another, there's the fruit. Talking to people, hey, encouraging somebody telling somebody about Jesus in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Not worldly songs, spiritual songs. Look at this. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There's the fruit. See, you can tell when people are filled with the Word. You can tell when people have got a hold of God and they're not ashamed. Man, you can tell when people have been filled up. Why? Because they're doing something. They've got wisdom. They've got the wisdom of God on them. They could teach you. They could tell you something about Jesus. Maybe they've never been educated. Maybe they've never gone to seminary. Maybe they've never had any formal education. But man, they can tell you something about Jesus. They can teach you. Sit down, son. Sit down, daughter. Man, let's, let's learn something about God here. And admonishing one another. What is that? That means speaking to each other, telling somebody, encouraging somebody, going after somebody. One another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. Man, it doesn't matter if you can't sing out loud. It doesn't matter if you can't play the radio. God's concerned with your heart, what you're dwelling on, and you make melody in your hearts to the Lord. Tonight, a couple of things, what we dwell on. Number one, will dwell on us. Second thing, what we dwell on delivers fruit. Final thing for tonight. You guys ready? All right, there was a couple more of you that time. That's good. What we dwell on determines our victories. What you dwell on can defeat you. If you choose to dwell on the past, it's going to defeat you. It's going to hold you captive. And it will literally tie your hands and you will be unable to be victorious in your life. That's the negative sense. But in the positive sense, what you dwell on can determine your victory. It can encourage you. It can inspire you. What you dwell on will produce fruit that will bring victory in your life. Why? Because if you dwell on the victory of Jesus Christ, because if you dwell on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for you, then it doesn't matter what happened in your past. You've got the victory already. Doesn't matter what the devil brings up. You've got the victory already. Doesn't matter what problems or pressures or trials or tribulations come against you. Why? Because you've got the victory where? In him. And as you dwell on the word of God, it will equip you with the wisdom of God that we just saw to be able to live a life that's pleasing to God and that's victorious in every area of your life. Let's take a look at it in the word. First John, kind of towards the back of the Bible, if you hit Revelation or Maps, turn around. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse number 14. First John chapter 2, verse 14, it says, I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you young men because you are strong 
and the word of God abides in you. Another word for abides is dwells. And look at this, and you have overcome the wicked one. Now, I want you to notice that there was a progression there. The first one is I've written to you fathers. Why? Because you have known him who is from the beginning. See, the people that are mature, that are fathers, know the father's heart, father God. And then he says, I've written to you young men because you are strong. But he doesn't just say you're strong and you overcame the wicked one like they did it in their own power. No, he says because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. So we who have the knowledge of God in the Father's heart and have the living Word of God dwelling on the inside of us now have what? And have overcome the wicked one. See, when we get a hold of who we are in Christ Jesus and what Jesus has done for us on the cross and where he is at currently in his ministry as high priest over the house of God, when you understand that Jesus is on your side, and that you're on his side and you dwell on him and you dwell in him and now he dwells in you and on you, you realize that you are walking and living out a victorious life in Christ Jesus. It's a revelation to some of us. But we've got to understand that we are not looking forward just to victory because Jesus will, yes, come again and all of his enemies will be made his footstool. But no, we are also looking from victory at the cross. Don't dwell on the failures of others. Don't dwell on the failures of your past. It's going to lock you up and keep you in defeat. Oftentimes, people are afraid to move out of their prison cell because they feel like they deserve it because of how bad that they were or how bad other people tell them that they are or how messed up they made things. But listen, God is not wanting you to dwell on those failures, not wanting you to dwell on the past. God is wanting you to realize that because of who Jesus is, that you have the blood-bought right to be a child of God, to be released of your chains, and to walk out of that prison cell and live a victorious life in Christ Jesus. I'm glad there's a couple of amens in here. Dwelling on the victory of Jesus will determine our victories in life. Philippians chapter 4, let's close with this. Philippians chapter number 4. And I'm going to read it to you, but I'll also put it up on the overhead in the New American Standard Bible. Philippians chapter number 4. We're going to take a look at verse number 6 through verse number 8. Philippians 4, chapter 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6 says, Be anxious for nothing. What does that mean? That means don't worry about it. You're going to go through life. Tonight, you're going to go home. There's going to be things facing you at home. Tomorrow, you're going to wake up. There's going to be things facing you when you wake up. Monday morning, job, pressures, getting the kids to school taking care of family, taking care of relationships. There's going to be bills that come. Tuesday's the 15th. Payday, what do we do? How do we steward? What are we doing with our lives? There are things that are going to be facing you, but the Bible tells us don't worry about it, don't fret, be anxious for nothing. Thanksgiving is coming up. You're going to be with family and friends, or on the opposite side of that, you're going to be alone. Don't worry about it. Don't fret about it. Be anxious for nothing. But look at this. But in everything. Everybody say, but in everything. Oh, come on. Play with me tonight. You guys are mighty quiet in this church. But in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So what is God saying? God is saying, I want you to bring everything to me. I want you to bring it with a heart of gratitude, with thanksgiving. I want you to make your requests be made known to me. I want your child to come to me. I want you to dwell in me, live with me, stay with me. I want you to wrap yourself around me. And look at what he says in verse number 7. And it says, And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, or some translations say understanding, look at this, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now listen, if you were in a battle and you were in a war, you could have only so much victory by yourself. But if you're in a battle and you're in a war and you're going out and you're facing the enemy and you have somebody guarding you, you're going to have a whole lot more victory. Is that right? 
So what is he saying? He says that the peace of God, as you bring your petitions to God, and as you don't worry about anything, but here you are with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds, where? In Christ Jesus. When you dwell in Christ Jesus, the peace of God will just cover you, protect you. You're going to have a lot more victory. Now take a look at the next verse, verse number 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellent and if anything worthy of praise, look at what he says, dwell on these things. Many times we have no peace and we have no victory because we're dwelling on the opposite of all those statements we just read. We're not dwelling on the truth, we're dwelling on a lie. We're not dwelling on what's honorable, we're dwelling on what's dishonorable. We were wrong. That was dirty. I can't believe that they would do that. They backstabbed those dirty people. I can't believe them. And all of a sudden we get ourselves out of the blessings of God and now all of a sudden we have lost the battle. We don't dwell on what's right. We dwell on what's wrong. What's wrong with the world? Politics and, and education and, and California and the government and, and my neighbors and, and what's going on here and what's going on there and on the job and in the school systems. And, and I can't, we dwell on everything that's wrong. We dwell on things that are not pure. Man, there is a plague going on in our society. People are spending more on pornography than, than even the NFL ticket sales. Then Vegas brings in for their concerts. There is a literal pandemic in the United States of America. People are dwelling on things that are impure, and it's causing them to lose the battle. Whatever is lovely, we dwell on unlovely things. We think about things that are unlovely. Ask any woman what they see when they look in the mirror, and they're going to tell you all their flaws. Most of the men will do the same. Sometimes you'll get a man that just is into himself. Just sometimes. Whatever is of good repute or good report. You know, sometimes we dwell more on the bad report than we do on the report of the Lord. But God says, whose report will you believe? Are you going to believe the doctor's report or are you going to believe the report of the Lord? Yeah, there, there may be some facts in your life. There might be some health issues in your life. But listen, God says, by his stripes you were healed. Whose report are you going to dwell on? Whose report are you going to believe? Whose report are you going to put faith in and trust in? Whose report are you going to invest your time and your effort and your energy in? Now, I'm not telling you don't listen to doctors. Listen to them. But also, have your ear attentive and dwell on the things of God. Find the healing scriptures. Find out the report. Man, sometimes we get a report, you're going to lose your house. And we start to dwell on that report, and we lose the victory rather than dwelling on what God says, that we are the head and not the tail. We're above and not belief that we will prosper in all the things that we put our hand to. See, we got to dwell on the things of God. And listen, it doesn't matter if I lose that house. I don't care about that. God has prosperity and blessing for me in my life. I am the diligent, and the diligent hand shall rule, the Bible says. See, we've got to change our mode of thinking and stop dwelling on things that are of a bad report. He says, if there's any excellence in anything worthy of praise, many times the stories that we tell and that we repeat aren't worthy of repeating. When you're with your families, it's going to be easy to dwell on the lies. It's going to be easy to dwell on what's dishonorable, how you've been wronged. It's going to be easy to dwell on impure things that have happened in the past, things that are unlovely, things that are of a bad report, things that aren't worth repeating. But listen, as you go into your life, as you face your job, your families, as you face your future, let's choose to dwell on whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is of a good report, and the excellence of things that are worthy of praise. Let's dwell on these things. Tonight, three things that we learned. Number one is that what we dwell on will dwell on us. Number two, we, we learned that what we dwell on delivers fruit that it's eventually going to produce something in our life. Finally, we learn that what we dwell on determines our victories. Tonight, if you got something, let's give him a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah.
want to just talk to some of you guys before you leave. It'd be a tragedy if we came into the house of God tonight, had such a good time as we did, and, and just sang the praises of God, experienced His presence, heard from the Word of God. I believe you guys got something. You guys were right there with the Word of God tonight, thinking about it, dwelling on it. And that would be a tragedy if your heart wasn't right with God and you left this place and you died and went to hell. I don't want that to happen to anybody. God doesn't want that to happen to anybody. And that's why he sent Jesus. Jesus told us, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. That means we can't get there your way, can't get there my way, can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way, and not all roads lead to God any more than all roads lead to the moon. We're going to have to get there God's way. And don't you think that God, who created the heavens and the earth, created the plan of redemption and carried it out in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Don't you think God would tell us how to get there? Well, he does in his word. A lot of times people hear that and they say, well, pastor, that's good news because I'm going to get to go to heaven because I've been a good person my whole life. Been, been good and, and done a lot of good. I used to be bad, but I, I changed my behavior and now I'm good. And, you know, I help people out. I, I, I've done good deeds in my community, done a lot of that social justice and, and help people out, gave money to charities. And that's all great, and I'm glad you did those things. But could you show that to me in the Bible where you do good things, help people out, be nice to your neighbors, do those social things that are good, and God lets you into heaven? It doesn't work like that. And you show me in the Bible where you change your behavior. You used to be bad, and now you're good. God says, oh, I see the change. They're good enough, and now they can get into heaven. Where does it say how good you have to be? Because I don't see a grading scale anywhere in the Bible. There's no curve that you have to be above or any line. That you be this good and you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. None of us can be good enough because the standard is perfection. And the only one who is perfect, well, his name is Jesus. Not going to get there just by being good. Because your goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags, the Bible says. And they're going to be thrown out. Not going to make it if you think that just by being good, you're going to get to heaven. I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. Some of you would say, well, pastor, I understand that, but I was raised in church. Parents took me to church as a child. You know, we're born in America. America's a Christian nation, and we, we went to church growing up. My parents had me baptized or christened as a child. Took me to religious classes, Sunday school, catechism class, Sabbath school. Hung a cross, maybe, or a St. Christopher around your neck. And you're, you're not any other religion. You're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, you're a Christian headed for heaven, right? Wrong. How do I know that? Because nowhere in the Bible does it say you're raised in church and that makes you a Christian headed for heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say America is the Christian nation. Everybody born in America goes to heaven. It doesn't work like that. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that you be baptized or christened as a child, wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, or because you're not some other religion that by default that lumps you in the category of being a Christian headed for heaven and denying hell. It doesn't work like that. Let's not play games tonight. I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you would say, well, pastor, I understand that, but not only when I was a child did I go to church, but here I am sitting in church tonight, and I consider myself to be a Christian. That's great. I'm glad you did that, but, you know, my car attends church. It comes to every church service that we have. It's not a Christian. You could sit in your garage, call yourself a car. Does that make you a car? No, absolutely not. So you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. Some of you would say, well, okay, yeah, I, I got that too. But, you know, not only have I attended church, my last church I got involved. I helped out. I carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions at that church. People thought of me as a leader. I, I taught in the Bible classes and, 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 you know, even got a membership card to that church. That's great. Once again, glad you did those things. But could you, could you show that to me in the Bible where you help out, get involved, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions? People think of you as a leader. You teach in the Bible classes and... Get a membership card that that's what gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible say church involvement gets you into heaven. Some of you might be thinking, well, pastor, I got you on this one. Somebody told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I mean, I know about Easter and the resurrection. I know about the baby in the manger at Christmas, sing the songs every year of my life. I, I, I know who God is. I, I could quote scriptures to you. I could tell you stories out of the Old and New Testament. And therefore, I'm a Christian. But the problem with that statement is if you've read your Bible, you know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. They know who he is. The devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
quotes scriptures in the Bible. You can read about it. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about having head knowledge about who Jesus is. And that gets you right with God, headed for heaven. But rather, this is about your heart. God is after your heart. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, He's always been after your heart. God is desiring all of your heart and all of your life. Jesus was speaking with a religious leader in John, the third chapter, by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a good guy, did good things. He was raised up in his church. He attended there. He, he became one of the leaders there, got involved. He had memorized a lot of the scripture. He could quote it to you. He could sing it to you. He could debate it with you. He became one of the teachers of Israel. And yet, we would have thought Jesus would have come to this great man, Nicodemus, and we would have thought he would have said, hey, Nicodemus, man, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing, and I'll see you in heaven. But rather, he does not say that at all. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, I know a lot of people turn off when they hear that phrase, being born again, because they don't understand what it means. They think that it's some spring, fall fashion or some weirdo, wacky thing because they've seen it portrayed as goofy in movies. Listen, this is not about what they say it is. It's about what the Bible says. Being born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing, and it means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm. What is that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. You want to know how I know? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected, vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to go just like this. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to be born again. I want to be headed for heaven, denying how I'll see your hand go up. I'll count, and you can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Did, did you just mean you were going to point at me and count? I'll be embarrassed if you do that. Uh-huh, you might be, but get over it. The reason why is because, think about it. Think about this for a second. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade, a moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell away from God. Mm -mm. And yet, tonight, your flesh is going to try and stop you. The devil's going to try and whisper in your ear, talk you out of it. There's going to be that wonder if other people are watching. Listen, we're all excited for you. There's no judgment here. We're, we're happy if you do this. We've all done it at one point or another, in some way or another. Tonight, this is your night. Will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life in this safe and friendly place tonight? Now, who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place and you know that's the condition of your heart, come on tonight, you can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, you can raise your hand right where you're at and then tell an usher right afterwards. I'm gonna count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up all together. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you guys. Anybody else real quick? Two wise people already on this side. Anybody else real quick? There's three. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? There's four up in the family room. I got you. I think there's a fifth one up in that family room. Thank you. I got you, buddy. Got you. There's about five wise people already. Anybody else? Thank you. There's six. Real quick, just raise them up high. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. Got you. Thank you. Thank you. About six wise people. Anybody else real quick? Six or seven wise people. Will you join them tonight? Anybody else real quick? I'm just going to scan across. If that's you, just lift your hand up when I'm looking your direction. Anybody? Anybody in this section right here? Anybody else? Real quick. 
real quick. All right, well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for about seven wise people. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask no one to leave during this time. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're going to give a clap and a shout. We're going to sing a song. As we do, if you raised your hand, you're one of those people that raised your hand, or you're one of those people that didn't raise your hand, but you should have. In a moment, hey, it's not too late. We're all going to stand as we do that clap and that shout as we sing this song. I want you to get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Get a friend if you need a friend. If you're in the family rooms, you can bring your kids. That's okay. They're allowed at this time. And I want you to meet me right up here up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. So let's all stand and welcome them. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Just make your way to the front. Hallelujah. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. From the family rooms, come on, bring your kids down. Bring your kids down. They'll remember this. You come. They're still coming. There's room up here for you. You can come too. Just make your way to the front right now. Anybody else if you need to come? All right, all right. Hey, everybody up front, look up at me for a second. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? Hard part's over. You made it down here. Now you got brand new life ahead of you. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be the best decision of your entire life. Now, because it's not easy, we want to help you. We want to do some things to get you strong in the ways of God so that you don't fall back into the ways of the world, but that you go on strong in your future with God. So right over here to my right, this guy in the black shirt, this is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's like the coolest guy in here. I know you were thinking, no, it's Pastor Dave, all right? Pastor Dave's going to do three things with you, okay? I'll let you know what they are. Number one thing he's going to do with you, he's going to pray with you, a simple prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again, brand new from the inside, all right? Second thing he's going to do is give you some free stuff, some free little literature, little booklets that our pastors wrote that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Third thing he's going to do, he's going to give you what we call an SPT. That means a spiritual personal trainer. Now, you've heard of a physical personal trainer, right? That helps you get strong at the gym, that sort of a thing, and get buff like me. Why are you laughing? I'm, I'm just kidding with you. But spiritual personal trainer will help you to get buff, strong, spiritually so that you can go forward in the things of God. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way, and he'll let you come right back in in a minute, all right? Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Woo!